um, you know, I think uh, part of you know what makes restaking both interesting and uh, also confusing the first time you hear it is uh, it's not clear where what the the extra risks are. Um, and uh, you know, I think hopefully we'll try to go through what some of those are, what different ways of mitigating them are, and uh, you know, overall making the the risk less scary. So, I'm sure you've heard twenty people today talk about what restaking is and how it applies to their scenario. I'm going to just give obviously the highest level view. Second, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of traditional financial things that sort of resemble restaking, uh, and then talk about the risks, and then making sure that I don't didn't write I made sure I didn't write any equations. We're just going to look at some graphs, and then finally talk about mitigations. Um, so this is a definition from Vitalik. Um, uh, notice he uses a hyphen, unlike other other uses of uh, the phrase. Um, but effectively, the idea is someone ha has a way of reusing their stake uh, to opt in to additional slashing rules, uh, and the stake is sort of completely divorced from maybe the network's activity outside of a security usage. So just as a high-level diagram, um, you know, you sort of ha you have ETH holders; they uh, either delegate via uh, liquid staking token or directly run their own validator, participate in a network, and generate this feedback loop between fees and slashing. Users submit transactions, uh, and sort of this is what things look like without restaking. With restaking, uh, we sort of have these new networks. The new networks might be, say, a roll up sequencer. The new network might be an MEV auction. New network might be FHE, you know, all the stuff you heard about today. And notice now that you have two, two steps of slashing and fees. Um, of course, the two, the two sort of steps are initialized by this restaking contract, oh, it's a tiny typo, uh, that deposits into a staking contract. And you can sort of think of this as you know, sequentially doing you know, restaking first, the restaking contract deposits in a staking contract. And the output that the ETH holder gets is principal plus L1 fees plus roll up plus restaking fees minus L1 slashing minus restaking slashing. Okay, so you've probably heard this all many times today, so I figured. So just again as an example, uh, and these are just me asking Dolly questions about ETH whales staking. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why it gave me this whale in a blinged out thing. Um, but basically, imagine you have an ETH holder. They have 100 ETH. They want to earn 10% yield by staking. They deposit into a staking contract, uh, you know, like Lido. Uh, and they effectively agree to Ethereum slashing rules uh, for things like equivocation, double signing, etc. cetera. Uh, the supporting Lido validators earn the 10% yield, but also get slashed. Uh, and when the holder withdraws, they get 107 ETH. Uh, I think somehow this got, became a typo. But uh, now instead, suppose they, they restake their 100 ETH. They get the 10% yield from staked ETH. They also get 5% from the restaking app. Maybe it's a decentralized sequencer. But the difference is now you have this kind of ternary tree of different ways they can get slashed. They could get slashed on ETH. They could slash on ETH and the rollup or the restaking app. Or they could get slashed just on the restaking app. Uh, and the key thing here is users and validators are opting into different risks. You know, this thing that was, hey, there's only a fixed set of slashing events, and you can kind of view them, you can kind of view the evolution of the process as L1 slashing event, L1 slashing event, L1 slashing event. You now have this sort of tree of, do you have an L1 slashing event, a both slashing event, or the roll-up slashing event? And that state space blow-up changes the, you know, kind of view of risk here. Okay. So now maybe a, a sound, seemingly unfun sounding concept of, of relating restaking to traditional finance, but you know, why not? So I would argue that restaking applications and AVSs are really sort of, in some level, verifiable corporate bonds. Um, you know, new networks 
want to get L1 security. In some sense, it's analogous to a company trying to use a, na a company or maybe even another nation state uh, using a nation's financial system to s and, and issuing bonds against that to secure their assets. Um, corporations and sovereigns issue bonds based on places with the highest security and liquidity. So, you know, for instance, Argentina, held hostage by investors for 10 years, still issues dollar-denominated bonds, uh, partially because it's the best place to do it. It has the most liquidity. The most people can borrow against their holdings and fund those bonds. Uh, and you could really think of, if we think of ETH L1 as issuing this kind of uh, sovereign currency, um, restaking applications are borrowing from the sovereign uh, and paying back with the variable fees they earn. Uh, earn. So, you know, again, people don't issue bonds everywhere. Right? If you look at the history of the corporate bond market, it is very concentrated in a small number of jurisdictions. People are willing to go outside their own legal jurisdiction to issue bonds in a certain place because liquidity is significantly better and exit opportunities are significantly better. Um, the repurchase agreement market is a market where people borrow against treasuries or bonds of, of a government. Um, and in the repurchase agreement, what happens is um, you have someone who lends you cash against the bonds, uh, and then over time you pay it back as you, you earn that, as you earn fees. So maybe that means you earn fees from running your company as a corporation, right? If I'm Airbus or Boeing, I store most of my cash in sovereign bonds, and then I borrow against it when needed when I have to make a factory or do something like that. And in 2023, realistically, there's, Ethereum is the only sovereign kind of entity that could support such a repo market. But one difference, I would argue, for restaking versus traditional uh, finance type of things is verifiability in the sense that default events, so when someone doesn't pay, when, you know, which is effectively one of these slashing rules that you opt into, default events are really enforced by cryptographic and partially incentives. Um, and they can be independently verified by the L1. So if you think about the government transaction, so I buy a bunch of treasuries, I borrow against it, and then I don't pay the person who I borrow from, that person can't really go to the US government and complain. The way they can complain is by trying to have a lawsuit and go through the court process. There's no way for them to be like, here's proof they didn't pay and you should slash them or you should cause an immediate uh, penalty. Uh, and because of that, the issuer of the asset of the treasury is not really economically aligned with the person who's lending the money versus in the AVS case, that is true. Um, and in some ways, this makes this process much less like DeFi lending and much more like bonds and, and the bond market. So I think this kind of schematic kind of should give you an idea of what I mean by that. Okay, so the next question is what are the, what sort of the ontology of the risks posed by restaking? Um, you know, of course, there's smart contract risk, uh, operator risk. Um, we're going to kind of ignore those. Um, realistically, the three highest level financial risks in restaking are slashing risks. So this is sort of your default event, default risks. Again, these are all pictures I asked Dolly to make based on the text I wrote. Uh, I have no clue why any of it. Like, well, first of all, liquidity is not spelled correctly. But uh, I, I don't understand why Bitcoin is the sun while there are people getting fished. But, uh, you know, whatever. In don't, don't ask the AI what, for an explanation. Um, so slashing risk, of course, is, you know, I opt into a, say, a decentralized sequencer network, and I don't submit a fraud proof, and, you know, watchtowers or others send a kind of, hey, you should get slashed event. That, of course, is the only way to lose principal directly and lose all your principal is via slashing events. Second, you have liquidity risk. Um, so, you know, if... You know, if you look at a lot of restaking protocols, they have liquid staking tokens uh, locked in them right now. If a significant portion of the liquid staking token is locked within a restaking pool, um, and, and 
a, la a loss of LST liquidity means that the LST's price is more volatile relative to ETH. Uh, the security of the AVS is denominated in LST terms on ETH terms, so the implied volatility for the end user is a lot higher. So this liquidity risk occurs when there's you know, over-concentration of the type of LST within an AVS. And finally, you have concentration risk, which is, you know, let's just take the, the DAO hack style example of suppose one third of ETH was in a single AVS, um, you know, more than a traditional BFT safety threshold. Uh, and suppose now that that one third could be slashed via rules that aren't ETH consensus, right? So maybe, again, I didn't submit a fraud proof and I get slashed versus being slashed for an equivocation or double signing or things like that, right? So there's a sense in which concentration also means these two systems are coupled. Okay, so I won't write any equations, so I figured I'd give you this nice meme disclaimer. But instead, let's try to think about how to visualize what the math looks like. This is not, this is not indicative of exactly all the math you should be writing, but this at least will give you a, a way of having like a zeroth order framework. So let's first consider, uh, so, so these diagrams will be of things where there is the, the y-axis is the value of a position over time. The x-axis is time. The red line is the point of hitting a default. So that's, in, in all these conditions, the default is sort of the worst case condition where the principle is completely uh, uh, goes to zero. Uh, and the idea is we'll, we'll, we'll compare a sequence of different applications and look at what their defaults look like. So on-chain lending, um, the default is sort of this indicator function jump to zero style default. You have the value of the position, it goes below some liquidation threshold, and then it jumps to zero. Uh, but there's sort of a single jump, and it's a random time, so it's a random stopping time depending on the actual process involved and you jump to zero. Next, let's consider perpetuals. So perpetual futures, whether on-chain or off-chain, generally have periodic funding rate updates. The periodic funding rate updates, uh, which are these sort of grid lines, but uh, maybe are not as easy to see, uh, there's sort of this notion of at these, at these funding payment times, you know, the net payment of the long to the short or the short to the long takes place, and it causes the value of the position to change. Uh, and so you have these kind of like periodic jumps. Uh, and those point, points are where you have these like close to default events. Now consider normal staking. So normal staking in a sufficiently decentralized network, sufficiently isolated, like many different nodes, many different overlay networks, different data centers, different houses, um, the slashing events should be IID. They should really be independent. There shouldn't be this thing of like, oh, AWS, US East 1 goes down and everyone gets slashed at the same time, right? If it's truly geographically independent. Now, whether that's true or not, you know, that, that's, that's an empirical question. But in this model of staking where there is sufficient decentralization, you should really have these losses due to slashing be IID events, right? So the idea is that the value of my locked principle is going up generally, and you can see this kind of, I have a slashing event, it goes down, right? And so there's this notion that defaults in staking are many, many jumps to go to zero, but they're independent and random. So the final question then is like, what does restaking look like, right? So if we go back, we have lending, single jump, you lost all your money. Perpetuals, you periodically have these funding payments that decrease the value of your position. Staking, you have these IID default events. And restaking, you now have these kind of correlated jumps. Um, and what I mean by that is I have a slash event for the AVS, that's the red slash. I have a slash event for the L1, that's the orange slash. And these things are related. They're not, they're not completely independent, and one slash can cause the other, uh, and you kind of have this the sequence of, of slashes. And so there's a sense in which when you think about restaking, you, you can't think of it in this like isolated world like you can with, with lending and perpetuals. So in lending, you really, really only care, if you think about it, 
of a single fixed threshold and a price, like the time the purple line crosses the red thing. Uh, probably should have shifted the purple line a little bit up. In perpetuals, you really care about these, what, what sort of the, the maximum deviation of the prices within these periodic intervals. In staking, when it's IID, you kind of, as long as you know, the, the, the time scale is long relative to the value scale, so sort of like the, the difference between these jumps is sufficiently long relative to the difference in the y-axis, you're relatively safe. But here, it's not something as simple, right? You really do have to consider this interaction between these two terms. Um, and so the, the interesting thing is that restaking provides, you know, you can actually replicate, and you, know, you have to trust me, but you can read this paper soon, that you can replicate all of the other payoffs with restaking, all the previous ones, plus do some that you can't. And so then this leads you to the nat natural last question, which is what do you actually do to kind of mitigate these risks? What can you do to, to ensure that you know, these correlated things are not too correlated and you, you, these jumps aren't too large at all at the same time? So realistically, there's two things you have at your disposal. First, parameter optimization. So each AVS has a bunch of parameters that controls the safety of the AVS whether it's TVL caps, how the slashing rules are uh, chosen. Like, you know, in, in this diagram, if you notice, the, the AVS slashes are all roughly the same size. But you could construct slashing rules that are sort of sequentially growing or sequentially shrinking depending on some conditions. You have much more freedom to do that than you do at L1 consensus. And so, the understanding how to dynamically choose the slashing is quite important. Um, you also have sort of a notion of the minimum amount of TVL you want. How you distribute fees? Do you lock up the fees? Do you, you know, do you, do you kind of ensure that you know you don't have ETH moving in and out at high velocity? And then finally, if you've read the Stakeshore paper, there's things like Stakeshore's parameters. The second thing, and this is sort of a thing we're starting to see happening organically, is people developing liquid restaking tokens for diversifying over many AVSs. So I can have a basket of AVSs uh, whose sort of slashing events don't, are not super correlated with one another. Um, and me as the ETH holder doesn't have to take the same sort of level of principal loss. Um, but there's a couple questions, of course, risk-wise. So how do you choose which of these AVSs should be added? How do you compare them? And you know, again, if you think about this picture, there's, you can start to see that there's some mathematical ways to compare these AVSs based on their value functions. And the second thing is if I have an AVS, you, know, you can think of this as this, if you, if, you, if you buy my analogy that AVSs are really corporate bonds, then you know, a liquid restaking token is sort of a bond fund. And the question is, how do you do rebalancing in that bond fund? How do you decide how to reallocate capital across AVSs? Um, and effectively, these two tools are, are what you have to kind of modify this picture to, to look a little more favorable. And with that, uh, that's it. So I have 